Hello again, on behalf of the Spina Bifida Association staff, welcome to the Spina Bifida Association's Community Information Session, Unveiling Potential, Raising Independent Children with Spina Bifida. My name is Judy Thibodeau, a member of SBA staff, and I and my colleagues, Jessica Palmieri and Juanita Panliter, will be with you for tonight's presentation. Before we begin, a few housekeeping, housekeeping notes. If you have a question or comment, please feel free to use the Q&A feature at any time, and we will try to get to as many questions as possible. However, there will be an Ask the Expert webinar on April the 9th, during which questions not answered tonight and others submitted when registering for the Ask the Expert session will be answered. You may also use the chat function to communicate, which we will not be monitoring as closely. You will receive the recording of this presentation and an evaluation survey. Please take a minute to complete the survey so that we will learn what topics are important to you for sessions like this in the future. Lastly, today's event is being recorded and we will post the video on our website soon. Our speakers tonight are Julia Bellarose, Boston Children's Hospital, and an adult with spina bifida. Julia's mother, Ruth Zames, and Dr. Andy Zabel, Kennedy Krieger Institute, Neuropsychology, and a member of SBA's Professional Advisory Council. Andy? Hi, everybody. Uh, I just and thank you, Judy, for that introduction. I'm really excited to be here with you and uh, with some new friends. Um, I, Julia, do you want to say anything more about yourself and, and, and do your own introduction as well? Sure. Um, so I'm Julia Bellrose. I recently graduated my MSW program, and um, I have a really special interest in assisting in the assisting those with spinal bifida with transition needs. Um, also, just in general, sort of self care needs, anything like that, um, with the lens of using strengths based um, materials or programs, so that people can maximize their potential. So I really appreciate this opportunity and had a great time working with my mother and Andy as well. Yeah, yeah. Ruth, do you want to do any additional introduction? Sure, hi everybody. Um, my name is Ruth Zames. I'm Julia's mom. Um, and professionally, I um, work in the nonprofit fund development space. I'm primarily a grant writer, and I specialize um, in federal and state um, funding. And I too had a great time putting this together with my daughter, Julia, and with Andy, and hope that some of what we share tonight um, resonates and that we all just have a nice time learning from each other. Yeah. And, and I'm Andy Zabel. I am a neuropsychologist from Kennedy Krieger Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and I've been working in the spina bifida clinic there for more than 20 years now. So, uh, and, and this is one of my favorite things to do is to do these kind of webinars. So thank you for, for your attendance tonight. Um, and it's not always the smartest thing to do when you start a talk to start nitpicking your title of your talk, but that's how I think we're going to start tonight. Um, he, here, the title is Unveiling Potential, Raising Independent Children with Spina Bifida, and that's a perfectly good title, and there's really no reason why I should start picking on it, but I do want to talk about that word independent, and, you know, as as Julia and Ruth and I uh, were talking about this, we, we started to wonder, like, is independent really what we're shooting for here, and ultimately, is anyone truly independent? Um, and, and that word to me connotates that, you know, you're not dependent upon other people. You you can kind of act for yourself and you're your own agent and you don't need other people around you. And I think the reality of the situation really is that um, if you switch the slide, um, one more, advance one more, I, I think it's probably healthier to think that we are, are interdependent upon each other. You know, I, as, as a parent, I need, you know, I need the, the school teacher to really do their job to educate my kids so that I don't have to take that on. I need my coworkers to do their jobs so that I can get my job done. And, 
you know, that's ultimately how things work the best is when we have trusted relationships and we can we can work with each other. Um, so, you know, I, the, I we will use the word independent, but I, I don't want to glamorize this idea of not needing other people. In fact, we all need other people. And so that's something really important to keep in mind here. Can you advance one more slide? And um, I'll introduce some new terms here. And so, and I honestly, I probably can't tell you the nuances or the differences between the word self-direction and self-determination. Maybe somebody else, you know, kind of knows that. But I think this is ultimately what we're shooting for, right? Is we want um, individuals with spina bifida to grow up to, to be self-directed and to exercise self-determination. And I just pulled some definitions off the internet here, but you know, self-direction, one of the definitions was just making your own decisions and organizing your own work rather than being what to, uh, told what to do by others. That doesn't mean that you don't rely upon others or interact with each other or even really depend upon each other, but, but you're really directing your own work and you have goals and objectives that you are pursuing. Um, Self-determination to me feels about the same. Autonomy, that might be a little much. I probably should have cut that word out of here. Self-rule sounds a little much. But, um, you know, ultimately that is what I think we're looking for is we want kids with spina bifida to grow up to be self-directed and 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 exercise self-determination. Um, Julia or Ruth, do you have any any comments on that before we proceed or any thoughts? Not on this one. Yeah. Julia, any thoughts? I was just going to say, I think it is really important to emphasize that sort of self-direction as opposed to complete independence is really important. I've learned that throughout, you know, my teenage years versus, you know, now being almost 30. It's really, really eye-opening to see that we all really do just depend on each other and we do need each other to a certain extent. And, you know, um. In certain circumstances, it might not be the best thing to say that, you know, we're truly independent and we don't need other people because that that in most cases is not true. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Let's let's advance the slide, please. And so, you know, as, as Julia and Ruth and I kind of talked about this presentation, we were kind of brainstorming and we've talked about this over this last weekend is you know, the question arises is why is self-direction hard to develop in spina bifida? Why doesn't it just develop naturally? And, um, you know, one of the one of the things that um, came to mind was the idea of expectations. Um, and oftentimes expectations can be set too low to really build independence. Oh, there I go with independence, with self-direction and, and self-determination. And, you know, before we go too far with this, I do, I, I want to say that in no way are we in trying to suggest that people aren't doing, you know, working hard or, or doing everything they need to do as parents or, um, or, or that anyone is doing anything wrong. Um, but what we do want to kind of talk about is the idea that um, sometimes it's, it's just easier to sometimes do things for people with spina bifida than to expect them to do that themselves. And one of the examples that I've heard before is just like, uh, you know, getting dressed in the morning when there's like five minutes before you got to get out the door. Sometimes a parent will say, look, I'm just going to get you dressed and, you know, uh, you know, you can work on dressing on the weekend or something. Uh, or if, if, you know, if we, if we let you do all the cathing at this point, it'll just take too long. I'm just going to take care of this. Um, but we do ultimately want to be intentional about the, the expectations that we set, because ultimately that's really part of how you learn and how you become self-directed and how you, you know, can do those things for yourself so that you're cleared up to do other things that you want to do. A, a child with spina bifida who knows how to do their own self-cathing can, you know, go to a sleepover that they want to go to and can participate in those kind of activities. So, again, don't, please don't hear us saying that that people aren't setting a high enough expectation or that, that anyone's doing anything wrong. But we want to be intentional about this, about setting expectations that really develop 
those self-reliance and self-determination uh, skills. Um, Ruth, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks for, for saying that. And I'll just add to that, um, you know, sometimes uh, I'll speak a little bit more specifically in, in some of the slides that follow about um, specific life examples and experiences that tie back into this theme about expectations. But um, uh, just for this slide, um, I will say that I can remember as a mom and as a while uh, as a single mom. So um, feeling this in the morning, you know, you've got to get yourself put together. We've got to get to school or we, we need to do X, Y, Z. And I can also remember saying to myself at the time um, that comprehensively this, the, this meaning the the self-direction or the self-efficacy um, of Julia is really going to be tied into like what I looked at as the long game. So that if I gave in to those moments of really like taking the path that was of less re least resistance, um, that that wasn't going to be good necessarily for the long game. That's not to say that I never, you know, rushed through a task because I had to, but um, there were times where I would say to myself in my head, like, no, we just have to ride this out. Or if Julia or one of the other kids would say, oh, we're going to be late for something, I would say, yes, we're going to be late. <laughs> that's okay. Um, so that's, those are my my thoughts here. Um, Julia, what about you? Do you want to add anything for this slide? Um, I think sort of going off that theme as well, it's interesting because I think a lot of what we talked about when we were planning this session was sort of how the experience of a person with spina bifida also sometimes does mirror just a person, you know, without spina bifida. You know, sometimes we all run late. We all you know, we all run out the door without our lunch in the morning and things like that. So I think it's important to drive home that although this session is spina bifida specific, we all have things that, you know, just go awry. And sometimes that just has to be okay. And we learn to run with it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, I agree. It's a kind of a normal part of life, but um, it's, it's, you know, we, we do need to make room for, for people to learn to, to develop these skills and, and allocate time, um, uh, appropriately. I, I actually, I looked at the chat and I'm going to drop in a comment from Ken here who says 80 years ago, my mom was told by the doctors, if he falls, let him figure out how to get up. And that has helped me throughout my life. What do you think of that comment, Ruth? Oh, I just have a big smile on my face because I think that's exactly right. Um, it's unpleasant to fall, but sometimes, um, you know, we learn through experience and reflecting on experience and we have to, um, you know, embrace, embrace that to the, ex in, uh, you know, to the extent um, that we're comfortable. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah. All right, why don't we go to the next slide? Um, here's another thing that kind of came to mind that uh, in in life, individuals with, with spina bifida oftentimes encounter barriers that, that society has maybe, probably not intentionally, but has, has unintentionally or indirectly created. And I, I you, those of you who have been to talks that I've given before, I, I will oftentimes show this on the left hand side, you can see this is a magazine cover uh, from a magazine in, in Berkeley, California in the 1950s. And at the time, if you were in a wheelchair in Berkeley, you um, were handicapped because you couldn't get onto the sidewalk if you wanted to go to a store or a theater. You had to, you were dependent upon someone else pushing you up there and getting you up. Um, on the right hand side of the the screen here, you see um, this is these are some real, you know, awesome uh, disability rights advocates who who literally went to the street and you can see the gentleman there holding a hammer and he's literally breaking up the curb. And this group is intending to pour their own curb cuts so that they can access Berkeley, California, which 
I just find really inspiring. And, um, you know, when you put a curb cut in, it's, it's good for everybody, not just people with wheelchairs. But um, I do think that that um, is one of the, that, that can be a limiting factor on self-direction, right? So if you can't access something or you can't uh, be it a website or be it, um, you know, a building or whatever it is, that certainly can disrupt your ability to direct your own activities and your own life. And, you know, may I, you know, sometimes you have to go around to the back of the school because that's the only accessible entrance, right? Um, instead of going through the front. And, you know, it's great to have accessibility, but that can that can interrupt things as well. Um, so I don't know, Julia, do you have any thoughts on this? I think the biggest thought that I had on that was sort of the theme of, so a lot of the challenges for people with spina bifida with self-direction stem from, in a lot of cases, I'm not saying every case, but executive functioning difficulties. And for me, when I started working, a big part of that was, okay, nobody's telling you what to do what the steps are to completing your job anymore, you're sort of, you're sort of put into the mix and expected to, you know, be able to figure out, okay, first you're going to do this and then you're going to take this person back to a room. And then, so it's sort of, you sort of have to figure out, okay, nobody is telling me what to do anymore. And that can be a little startling for a second in my experience, honestly. Mm -hmm. So you sort of have to learn what to do with that and, um, just sort of run with it until you can create your own routine for your workplace that works for you and allows you to get your job completed. Yeah, that's, that's so interesting. Sometimes the barrier can even just be like not telling you what to do or just expecting that you would just know what to do in that situation. So um, that's interesting. Ruth, do you have any thoughts on that, on barriers? Uh, not on barriers with this slide, but I'll I'll speak a little bit. I, I just saw um, a, a question in the Q&A too, and I'll get to, in the next couple of slides, we'll really get to some um, specifics in, in, uh, away from general barriers. And I'll talk about yeah. some strategies for um, motivation and um, some other things to address um, barriers that were specific to uh, my life experience, but not right now. I don't have anything else okay. to add. Yeah, then, okay, let's go ahead and advance the slide. Um, what, one thing that I, I always like to highlight is that people with spina bifida just honestly have more things that they're required to do than, than the typical person on the street. You know, you, without physiologic cues sometimes, have to just stop what you're doing and remember to self-catheterize yourself four or five times a day. You know, maybe take an hour or two and, and do a bowel program every couple of days. Um, you know, if you if you have AFOs, you know, you have to intentionally watch for pressure sores to make sure that you don't have skin breakdown. Or maybe you have to do wheelchair push-ups or, you know, maybe just even like the burden of like having to monitor physical symptoms like headaches. You know, if I get a headache, I I'm not going right to the concern about a shunt failure. But, you know, that is something like headaches are something that you have to monitor if you have spina bifida and, and think about it. So um, I think I think it's it's uh, it's really important to recognize that um, the, the people with spina bifida have way more that they're expected to do. And that that can take time away from or even interrupt the continuity or the momentum of some of the things that they want to do. You know, you just get started on something and then you have to stop it so that you can, you know, do your capping. Um, so so I, I think that's something that we want to always have in mind. Um, Ruth, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think too, to add to that, that sometimes these um, different things can, as a, as a mom, I often felt like, oh, how do I infuse more joy? Because I recognize that sometimes it could be a real bummer that Julia had to do all of these different things and, and other things on top of it. And um, so creating intentional space for like humor, that was a great strategy. Julia has the best and most dry sense of humor. 
Um, and sometimes also just like, even in like a really tough medical situation or, um, dealing with shunt malfunctions and so forth, um, trying to, even though they're bad situations, trying to find, um, a bit of, a positive, um, you know, any positivity that you can find in the situation, um, and really to, to make time for, for games and play and things like that deliberately as part of your daily routine, those were really important for, um, for our family. Do you remember that, Julia? I do. Yeah, we would frequently have, you know, family game nights or movie nights, things like that, just so that we can sort of um, come back together as a family, you know, at at night after school, you know, when everybody's been gone all day, just to sort of relax and spend time together. And that was always nice. That's great. That's great. And so not letting these things really interrupt, is that kind of what you're getting at too, Ruth, is like being intentional and maybe these things interrupt activities, but planning activities in a way that, you know, they can still occur and still have fun. Yeah. And sometimes when you don't have a choice, right? Like when you're in, you're in the hospital, like Julia was in third grade, she had a, a sh um, shunt infection and she was in for a couple months and trying to really like bring that joy and that humor and like these little things we would find to like, just hold on to as, um, you know, like it was almost like a silent way of communicating funny jokes and things because that, that keep, it sustains you through these, um, these things that are interrupters that you don't really want to be, but you don't have a choice in the matter. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the chat and I think we're getting kind of to the, the spot, you know, where we can start talking, why don't we advance the slide and we can talk a little bit about, um, there's questions about executive functioning and motivation. Um, and uh, I can start by talking about that a little bit. Um, but I, whenever I talk about, as a neuropsychologist, we love to talk about executive functioning. Um, but before I do, especially in the context of spina bifida, I, I always wanna talk about how there are just more things to do with spina bifida because you know, if I had to stop and self cap four or five times a day, or if I had to do a lot of these things that are just medical self management responsibilities, I would forget, I would look forgetful, I would look disorganized. And you know, it would put, I like to say that it puts a, an additional executive function burden upon people with spina bifida, because they have more that they have to remember to remember to do. Um, so with that said, there is some evidence to suggest that, that individuals with spina bifida, because of, of the, the brain impact, can have symptoms of executive dysfunction. And hopefully a lot of you have heard about that or, or kind of are familiar with the concept. Um, but, you know, some of the ways that it's probably most pronounced uh, among the, the people that I've met with spina bifida um, include initiation. So just getting started on something. Um, I've heard that from teachers where they say, sometimes, you know, I can explain it and the person knows what they need to do, but I still need to go over and tell them to get started. Or, you know, getting started can be a bit of a problem. Um, organization can, can be an issue sometimes. And, you know, remembering all the things you have to remember, but also just kind of getting through the routine of life. Sometimes that could be somewhat overwhelming because of symptoms of executive dysfunction. And even uh, the concept of working memory, or, you know, I, I like to think of it as like things that I have to remember to do or things that I have to remember to remember you know, if you have to stop what you're doing um, and remember all these things, that can that can be difficult. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think is really impactful is, you know, to have an organizational approach and have, um, you know, some interventions to help with that. And I think that's, that's coming up in the chat here a little bit. Um, and we'll talk about how 
you can address that as a person with spina bifida, how you can address that as a, a parent of someone with spina bifida, and even as a provider for someone with spina bifida. But um, do you, uh, either of you want to say anything about executive functioning or, you know, your approach to organization or, you know, motivation or, you know, initiating goal-directed action? I think for me, when it came to all that, it was really important for me to take ownership of it as soon as I realized sort of what my challenges were going to be. And I say that because I was sort of in the phase where I wasn't so keen on, you know, my parents sort of doing a lot of things for me and really wanted to do everything myself. And although I realized at this point that that's just not possible, as we're saying, you do need help with certain things that you know, taking control of your own sort of well-being and self-care actually feels, you know, feels really good um, as opposed to, you know, needing constant reminders and things like that. So once I was able to internalize what the strategies were that I was supposed to be using for managing all that, and I was at a place where I was able to start using them, a lot of things got better. And I, I think that's very important. Yeah, yeah. So you had some strategies that you you learned and you internalized and uh, you kind of almost deployed when you needed them. Any Any strategies in particular or approaches that you took? Um, I think for initiation, one of the biggest things was when I was doing something, I like to think of it as empty space in my brain. And when I knew that there was sort of empty space where just nothing was going on, I would look at my, look at what I was doing or look at people around me and say, okay, like, what is everybody else doing? Like, what is the task that is, you know, being started right now? And what do I need to do to start that task? Um, Unless, because personally, I have difficulty with math. That was always difficult for me. Um, so that was one of the things that I didn't like to initiate myself. That's also a big part of it is, you know, the preferences of the task that's being initiated, I think. So mm -hmm. it really just depends the strategies you use based on what the task is, in my opinion. There were, there were some things you didn't really want to do and you didn't want to get started on them, essentially. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Ruth, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, that could be, I remember that well, and it was really, it could be challenging, um, but also to um, being okay with saying, for example, okay, well, we've had a talk, you know that you need to do X. If you don't do X, what do you anticipate might happen? Um, and, you know, sometimes Julia would give you a very sophisticated answer, um, but wouldn't initiate the task. And then, you know, you'd circle back to it. And unfortunately, like some of these things are pretty serious. Like if you don't follow the procedure that you're supposed to for cathing, or if you're not cleaning properly or whatever, you know, there are a lot of examples, but well, you could get sick. Um, you can get sick even if, if you are doing that right, but there are, there, some of these things are higher risk. And I think, um, unfortunately, letting Julia have a few instances, like there was an instance with a pressure sore that got pretty bad. And that took, I think that was a huge learning um, lesson for both of us, but um, like how to navigate that. And like, at what point did I have to step in? And at what point was I letting her kind of learn like, okay, you don't, you're not following, um, you know, you're not initiating the approach that the doctor has, you know, prescribed, what is the consequence? And, in, and then it was the reality of those consequences setting in that I think, um, you, you do that a couple times through different experiences. And um, I have seen like a 180. N now Julia is like the most responsible adult. And it's so I guess at some point it it um, came back. There, there's, um, there's a question in the chat from, from someone who sounds like, 
you know, they've tried to do the things that a neuropsychologist would probably recommend. What about rewards? What about this or that? You know, what about breaking things into smaller pieces? Uh, or what about like, you don't get your phone until you've done what you're supposed to do. Um, can you relate to any of that frustration? And uh, was is that maybe some of your advice that, you know, uh, opportunity, you know, continue to present opportunities for responsibility or, or what would you say? Yeah, continue to present opportunities for responsibility, but also um, sometimes, I don't want to say demand it, but there, there was a strictness, I think, to my parenting or a rigor um, that um, maybe wouldn't have been what the neuropsychologist would have recommended. I'm not sure, but I can remember meeting with um, the neuropsychologist who I, I have very warm affection for, but I can remember thinking like, okay, I'm going to listen to what they're saying and I'm going to internalize it and find my truth in what they're saying. Like, mm, I, I, that makes sense. That I'm not so sure applies to Julia. And so I was constantly taking in information, but then to, I guess to say, to not be afraid to um, make your own, like form your own truth and your own um, judgments using the wisdom, of course, of everybody else, especially the experts around you, but, um, and then kind of work with that to see if that can help get you any further than just, you know, taking the script per se um, and working with that. I, I, um, yeah, that would be kind of what I think I, I did at the time. And I got yeah. pushback for it. You know, sometimes you're, you you have to also be, you know, as long as you're in the bounds of being of being safe, um, it's okay. Give You got to give yourself permission to, um, to be a little bit outside of the box, I think, sometimes. Yeah, we have a comment here. Someone said that they can hear the old school nurse screaming, and and responding poorly to what you said <laughs> but but maybe maybe you just have to be able to tolerate that yeah. it, it feels like ruth it feels like we're moving into like just parenting strategies and this is great to talk about because julia is so awesome so is julia it's okay that we tell these stories though still yes okay. if i could just actually touch on this for a second as well um yeah. based on the question that you received I think it's important to realize, too, that at a certain age, the child realizes that these strategies and advice is coming from a third party. And although they do want the best for them, that's not the thing that they want in their lives at that point, um, which is tough because, you know, again, they mean the best for them and they do want them to thrive. But one of the reasons that, at least in my experience, they may not be so in tune with following those routines and doing those things at this point in time is because they know that they're different and they know that this advice is coming from someone that's trying to help them medically and that might not be what they're about at this point. So it may be just, I'm not saying completely back off and, you know, allow them to not do what they have to do, you know, medically or anything like that, because you know, that absolutely has to be done. But there may be some things that, you know, in a very loving way, the parent is trying to enforce the routines or whatever it is to something that may not be completely and utterly, you know, necessary to the daily routine. And that might be something that's okay to back off of for a little bit, just to give some breathing room for the child to realize that, no, like it is okay to use these strategies because in the end, it's going to help you and the using the strategies and routines isn't going to have to be called out so much as time goes on because you're just going to internalize well in a lot of cases you'll internalize them and be able to use them more automatically yeah it feels like we're we're, we're drifting into like some of our next couple of slides so maybe we can like advance one this is just a real short slide but essentially you know we're interested in what can you do to raise a self-directed child with spina bifida 
and there's roles for different people. So why don't we advance it one more time and I'll turn things over to Ruth. Sure. So um, I'll say that parenting any child, um, I have um, three children. So parenting any child is the hardest job that I've um, ever done. And then when you parent a child with spina bifida, there's um, some layers or differences. Um, I so I'm going to I'm just going to um, not. I know I see your your chat in your Q and A coming in. I'm just going to go through this, and then if I you know I'll get to hopefully I'll be able to to answer some of the questions. Um, so I think the the best advice I could give um, is learning to be comfortable. I'll start with the last with ambiguity because all of the examples that I'm going to go through really quick um, are tie back to there isn't a solution per se or that the solution for one person with spina bifida might not be the same as the solution for the next person. Um, and But having said that, um, be protective here, it says, of your child with spina bifida while off, off, you know, also giving them opportunities to make choices. Um, and I can remember a few examples. Um, when Julia was in kindergarten, I came into her, her class um, and there were a bunch of kids playing. It was a parent uh, parent day and Julia had ha had an accident, a bowel accident. And um, one of the children um, was, you know, he was a kindergartner. He didn't mean any harm or ill will, but he's like, oh, I don't want to be around her. Like she smells, I'm not going to play with her. And that for me as a parent, like I had to leave the room. I was, you know, in tears. It was mildly devastating. And Julia, the, you know, it, like she carried on and I was like, hmm, okay, maybe my, like I have to self-assess, like what is my, how, how are my re reactions or interactions, you know, affecting what I was speaking to before about the long game. So her resilience or her ability to be able to bounce back from these situations. Um, so that's, that's sort of one, one area. Um, Another area is um, like advocacy. Well, I'll, I'll mention a little bit about that. So um, I can remember um, Julia, again, when she was going to go into kindergarten, the local school district had said, um, well, there is this older school. It's in your district where you live is this is the school that she's assigned to. But it didn't have an entrance um, for Julia to go through the front door. So they had mentioned that she would be able to use the back door to the school. And I, you know, was not okay with this. And I think, uh, you know, I made some quick assessments and I was like, well, what are we gonna do then about like fire drills? What's your plan for this? And, you know, quickly got to the fact that there really wasn't a good plan and there really wasn't any reason that Julia shouldn't be at the um, accessible school. And I'm using that story because Julia is watching me the whole time that like that interaction is happening and she's hearing me get on the phone with people and she's hearing me advocate. I think it's also sending a message to her like you, you are worthy. This is not an acceptable choice. Um, and this goes to for like her IEP meetings. I started having her come to the meetings around second grade because um, it was important that she begin to become aware of what her accommodations were so that if she wasn't receiving them in class, she could say to the teacher, um, you know, I think this is on my IEP. Is it something like, and honestly, the teachers were appreciative of it because sometimes it helped, you know, facilitate things, make, make, um, make it a bit easy, a bit easier. Um, also too, with advocating, um, there were some times where I would show up, um, at the school one time and Julia was in the office just hanging out with the secretaries. Um, I think having like cookies and tea or something. And I was like, what is going on here? And um, the school nurse came out and we had a conversation about like, 
Julia was kind of manipulating the system. Like she was out of class and she was very small and had already learned like that people were going to bend or give her a little bit. And I instantly was like, oh, this can't happen. So also like, again, setting the expectation with other adults that your expectation is such and that that's, you know, not helping the child long-term. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, this is the hardest one, I think, um, is be protective while at the same time trusting your child because so many of these unknowns are um, for any child, but like they're, they take a greater, um, they assume greater risk for kids with spina bifida. So like wanting to go on the the um the rafters with the other kids at the at the like the local holiday pageant um like that's a risk like and you sit there and I can remember saying like I was literally holding my breath is she gonna fall what's gonna happen um so having you know taking that trusting yourself trusting the situation trusting the adults that are generally have been wonderful throughout our lives um to to do this work as a community um yeah and I, it's just it's it's really hard but um but there are things that can that can help and i hope that um that that was helpful and i'll i'll try to answer anything to that i i can um uh after after we're through here and does, do you have anything else um andy or julia there I don't think so. I think you covered that pretty well. Do you want to tell us more about this tea party you were having with the secretaries, Julia? <laughs> oh, I was, it was great. I was living it up that, that whole time. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I, I remember it vividly, but I don't remember what I was getting out of. If I had to venture a guess, it was probably art because I hated art. <laughs> so it was probably something like that. The nurse was in the same sort of corridor as the secretary. You would just shoot right over. So... <laughs> And I guess I was probably, you know, I went to the nurse for whatever it was. I had to cath, whatever. And then I just shot over there and I was like, hey, and just, you know, struck up a little bit of a conversation. It was fine. Yeah. Um, hey, there is a there is a comment from someone about knowing how to navigate the medical system and learning to kind of almost understand your medical condition and advocate in the medical setting. Is there anything you want to add, Ruth, about like helping Julia learn about spina bifida and how to advocate for herself? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, thanks for that question. I actually had that in my notes and forgot to mention it, that um, one of the things I did at medical appointments that was really difficult was to remind myself to not speak as much as was instinctive um, because I kept this question in the back of my mind always, like what would happen if something happened to me? Would Julia be able to, you know, take care of herself? So I tried to not, you know, say as little as I could as she got older. Um, and then the provider providers eventually were really good about um, interacting and interfacing directly with Julia. Um, and then they um, would give her books, like she got a book about uh, spina bifida, a book about cathing, and then... Um, we also did like some anatomy stuff where like we would look at the spine, you know, basic stuff, nothing. And like we would, she would identify like where, where her level was. And um, so I think just helping hand that off as soon as possible. And I'll just a quick little anecdote. It actually was one time Julie was overnight in the hospital. I had gone home to shower before going back in and she called me and she said, mom, they almost gave me the wrong medicine, but I knew that that was a nebulizer because it's what my sister takes. And I said, oh, okay, like, good thing. Good. Like, it's good. You, like, she was able to speak up and say, no, that's not mine. Um, it's nothing that would have been catastrophic, but, you know, so handing that off as early as you can, um, obviously you're there as a parent, you're still listening, you're you're um, processing it underneath the surface, but it was very clear very quickly that Julia was um, just fully engaged and um, and it helped her a lot. And she developed some beautiful lifelong relationships with her care providers that came out of that too. So thank you for, for that question. Yeah, that's great. 
Um, well, why don't we advance the slide? And Julia, we'll turn things over to you. Oh, no. Yeah. Do you want to talk about your siblings or do you want your mom to? Um, I can I can do it. And then, mom, if you kind of want to jump in every once in a while, that's fine. Um, so I'm going to start by saying I have arguably the best siblings in the world. I love them all to pieces. Um, and as the slide says, they can be very helpful with making sure that, you know, things are set straight when even when your sibling has spina bifida, you know, you get chores. Like, that's not fair. If one person has to clean the bathroom, like, obviously, that's not a fun time. But, you know, your your sibling, even though they have spina bifida, can help out. Um, so I babysat my, my um, one of my younger sisters a lot when I first, you know, became sort of late middle school to high school age. And I think that really helped me establish a sense of um, responsibility, but also just self-esteem in a way, because, you know, I would have to make sure that I was responsible enough to, you know, get myself off my bus into the house and back out to get her off the bus, um, which I really enjoyed doing. Um, but I also kind of realized something the other day that I think I sort of talked about briefly with mom and Andy is that is sort of a thing that sort of helped me build my skills for initiation with a task too, because, you know, that's sort of an immediate, you know, you can't forget to get your sister off the bus. That, that would be sort of catastrophic in a way, you know, I'm sure there's whatever protocols, but th that's not important. Um, so basically you can't forget to get your sister off the bus. So you, right away, you have to sort of plug that into your brain to say, okay, you go home, you, you take off your bag, you know, get a snack and then go, you know, get your sister off the bus. And um, so I really liked that and sort of knowing when to intervene and not another funny sort of antidote that we were talking about the other day was um, I would babysit my sister, but not be sort of hovery. And she would make potions with all of the soap in the bathroom. And so my mom would keep saying, where the heck is all the soap going? And I was like, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say anything for a while. Um, but, you know, so that sort of thing was really cool because that was sort of our sister thing where, you know, it was harmless, but no one was telling mom where all the soap was going. So I really liked that. Um, but one thing that I really appreciate about them is that they hold me accountable. So this, this one's a funny one. It says, could you get me? No, but can you can get your own so I would ask my one of my sisters to you know get me a snack or something because I was busy doing whatever I was doing and didn't want to get up and they would always be like no no I'm not getting you a snack like you can get up and get your own it's going to take you two minutes and you know I learned that pretty quickly um and with our family your game sisters, nights your sisters we were... just were not having that huh? your, or your nope. siblings were not having it yeah not at all um, and so with the family game nights that we would have, you know, they wouldn't let me win. Like games in our house were so intense. They were <laughs> down to the last man standing. And I remember that being actually a really good memory because like the competition was fierce and we all had a lot of fun with it, you know, except for the person that lost. But, um, you know, that was great. Um, the amount of time and effort on school related work would be something that also needed to be equal. You know, mom always said that the grades don't necessarily have to come out the same, but the amount of time and effort that you put into an assignment, you, you know, sort of had to match up as best it could. Um, we were talking about the other day, I was not, I was not good at chem chemistry and different things. And there were just subjects that were really hard for me. And whether that was spina bifida related or not, I think mom just realized at some point that, you know, there are some things that some people just aren't going to grasp and that's that's okay um but as long as you put the amount of effort that you know your sisters are putting in or the amount of effort that you feel is appropriate then you know it is what it is we'll figure the rest out um and just being reminded that you know there are a lot of things for the amount of things that I could do there was or couldn't do excuse me there were so many more things that I could do so even though I had minor setbacks with you know school related things every once in a while there were still a lot of good things that I was capable of accomplishing at that point and I really appreciated that throughout my life as well yeah yeah 
Ruth, do you, do you want to comment on any of this? Very nice job, Julia. No, Julia, that was really well said. I don't, I don't have anything else to add to that. But you would, you would call her siblings and help. They helped develop this slide, right? Yeah, they, that. they developed this slide. <laughs> <laughs> love that. All right. Well, let's, let's, uh, I'm watching the time. Uh, let's uh, move forward one slide, please. Um, and then, uh, Julia, this is, this is something you wrote. Do you want to walk us through this? Sure. So um, the big heading is what steps can I take to increase my self-direction? And there's a lot of different ways you can go about this. Um, but the biggest thing that I think is helpful is to um, take steps to determine and recognize your strengths and weaknesses early on. Because what I found is that when I'm trying to accomplish something, if I'm trying to use my weaknesses to sort of I'm a person that likes to sort of build my weaknesses as much as I can, but if I'm trying to do that to get something accomplished in the moment, it's gonna be a lot more difficult than if I'm to just switch gears and use my strengths. So a lot of strengths-based work, work is important until you're able to sort of isolate your weaknesses outside of a task and work on those separately before incorporating them back into a task, I find really important. Um, and don't necessarily ruminate on your weaknesses because that's that's going to be, you know, I think in the short and possibly long term detrimental to your self-esteem and your mental health. Um, certainly not saying don't work on them if that's what you desire to do. And that's that's what, you know, other people are sort of wanting and willing to help you do. I think that's excellent. But I'm just saying don't sort of ruminate on them to the point where it's detrimental to you. Um don't be afraid to ask for help. Again, that's not unique to spina bifida. So many people need help with so many different things, aspects of their life that it's not, you know, a big deal at all to say, okay, I'm really stuck on solving this problem. Can you help me? Um, that's totally okay. And use the supports that are put in place to maximize your strengths. Again, with sort of either the school or work related things, don't be afraid to use the supports that, you know, your teachers or your employers are able to put in place to help you be successful. They might be unique to you, but they aren't. And they can be unique to spend a bit as well. But again, that's sort of something that's universal. Um, we all help each other in the workplace or at school. And it's not necessarily just that one thing that's making you successful. So try not to ruminate on, oh, I need extra help that's that's totally okay and a lot of people do and speak to your provider or someone in your everyday life if you're if you want to you know remove a certain support from whether it be you know um something from your IEP you don't feel you need a certain accommodation anymore sort of before sort of completely stop before you completely stop utilizing it sort of talk to someone and Try to think about the implications that's going to have on you, you know, academically or socially or whatever it is, just because um, I've learned from experience that a lot of these accommodations, if you do try to take them away, um, they were there for a reason and they were sort of assisting you in that way. So if you pull them out, you might feel fine in the moment while you have them to pull them out because you don't understand that once they're pulled out, you don't have that support anymore that was helping you to be successful. So definitely talk to somebody if you're considering doing anything like that. So yeah. Andy or mom, I don't know if you have anything you want well, to add I, to those. I love, I love it. Um, Ruth, do you, do you want to add anything here? But I, I do have a question that I want to pose to both of you too, just from the chats, but Ruth, do you have a, any comment on this? No, I'll, I'll, um, I saw that question and I think I'll, if you want to pose that question, I'll, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, think back you two, like, you know, back, back in the old, you know, back in the day um, where uh, maybe you can relate to this. There's a couple of questions. There's one person that uses the term, uh, what do you do if, I, if my child has demand avoidance? I love that term, demand avoidance. Uh, there's another person who has brought up, it's just so frustrating that, you know, my daughter says she can't do things when I know that she can. 
Do you guys have any thoughts on that? You know, think back to when Julia was a little girl or Julia, think back when you were a little girl, what, what would you advise people? So, um, I definitely experienced that, um, with Julia and one of the tools that I utilized was outsourcing. And what I mean by that is that if I, if Julia would say to me, like, I can't do this or task avoidance or all of those, um, sort of those scenarios that you mentioned, I, I would say to myself, okay, well, let me put that task or that thing in the hands of a really highly qualified third party. Like I, I, you know, I just don't think I'm going to be able to walk that far, mom. I, you know, whatever it might've been, or I just really don't want to do that. And then I noticed that if I put her, like I have a, a very dear lifelong friend who is a um, nutritionist and a personal trainer. I had friends who were like um, swimming instructors. I had um, other people like coral, coral groups, um, that Julia did. And it was quickly apparent that what Julia wouldn't or couldn't, didn't, or, you know, maybe didn't want to do for me, she was eager to demonstrate with like another person. So that showed me like, okay, um, I, she, she walked a 5k when she was, I'm not sure, it, very small. And it said like, um, last place finishers day's biggest winner in the newspaper and because and she was like uh, you know so just things like that you it, it's amazing the resistance that they'll give you as the parent and um, I think it was a maybe it was the neuropsych psych at the time said to me that's okay that means that they trust you and they're on their worst behavior for you but like what they're doing with other people, that's all good. That will come back. Like you can, you know, keep doing that. Keep pulling in all those other resources that you, I utilize my parents, my family, um, like we said, her siblings. So anybody that could take some of that burden off of me and really like that takes a village. It really took a village and, and we, we made use of it. Julia, you have any other thoughts on that? I, that was so nicely put, Ruth. Yes, I think kind of coming from another angle, saying that you don't want to or you can't do something is a really great opportunity for a conversation starter with your child or, you know, young adult, just because, you know, you're going to kind of want to dive in and say, okay, well, why do you feel like you can't do that? Or what's the barrier to, you know, sort of being successful um, in this realm. And I think, I think one of two, one of a few things is going to happen. I think first they, they might not be able to come up with a reason for why they can't do it. And they'll say, okay, well, maybe I can, or, you know, it's going to open up a bigger conversation about, well, this takes a lot of planning and a lot of organization, you know, take, for example, I think a school project, you know, I remember, I remember sort of getting those two or three weeks in advance and then the night before saying, mom, can you go out and buy me poster board? Like this is due tomorrow. When she was like, what? So I think kind of along the lines with those tasks, you kind of have to lay out a couple weeks in advance. Like, okay, what are you going to do on the first day that you get the project assigned? Maybe it's as simple as like, okay, you go out and you buy the poster board. Like, that's taken care of. You don't have to worry about that. So sort of scaffolding the tasks as much as you can. And I think that might even be helpful in the medical space. But also, I think one of my big interests is to be able to help people with spina bifida eventually create, you know, um, books or journals of their experiences with spina bifida so that they have all that information at their fingertips so that, you know, if they do need a surgery or they do, they know what medications they're allergic to, um, that sort of thing to be able to help them sort of take those bigger aspects and break them down into smaller chunks. You guys, we're, we're out of time. Um, were you going to say something, Ruth? No, I'm, I'm, I, I was going to say we didn't get to your slide. We have to get nah, to your my, but, but the, I want to end on that because I think that that was so perfectly put. I can't, I can't build on that. But I do. Can we advance the slide to uh, Judy's slide? She's going to talk about the next um, series. 
Thank you, Julia, Ruth, and Andy. This has been amazing and really fun to hear your personal experiences, Ruth and Julia. And thank you all for joining this webinar. Please remember to complete the evaluation that you will receive in the next couple of days. Please register for the Ask the Expert session scheduled for April the 9th. Julia and Ruth and Andy will be the experts in addition to Shannon Bevan. So it'll be a great time for you to propose your questions in advance and during the session. When you register, you'll be able to submit questions, as I said. There will be a session for adults navigating independently as an adult on May the 26th. Thanks again for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, thank you. Thanks guys. Are we...